from completing ground tests for Starship 29 to preparing the orbital launch mount for booster testing, SpaceX is making waves at Starbase. But that's not all, in a surprise move, they've begun demolishing the launch mount at Kennedy Space Center. Meanwhile, construction of the static fire test stand at Massey's is progressing rapidly, with additional parts for the water-cooled flame diverter arriving just last week. Join us as we uncover these latest developments. Starship 29, the ship set to launch in Starship's fourth integrated flight test, recently completed two back-to-back -back static fire tests as part of its pre-launch preparations. The ship, which has been resting at the production site after completing the spin prime test on March 11, was rolled out to the launch site on the 22nd to resume engine testing. Upon arrival, the ship was hoisted onto the test stand in preparation for the static fire test. On Monday noon, frost began appearing on the ship, indicating propellant loading for the imminent static fire. Engine chill commenced 40 minutes late to precondition the engines to the right temperature for ignition. 20 minutes later, Ship 29 ignited all six Raptor engines for about five seconds, successfully completing its full-duration static fire test. It was the first time the ship ignited its engines after their installation. Ship 29 performed its second static fire test on Wednesday, March 27. This time it was a single-engine test utilizing propellants drawn from the header tanks. The test aimed to simulate the in-space Raptor engine burn plan during the coast phase of Flight 4. Having completed both the full duration and in-space engine burn static fires, I think it's safe to assume Ship 29 has completed all the required pre-launch tests. As per the road closure schedule, Ship 29 is set to return to the build site on March 29th. At the build site, the ship will undergo inspections, checkouts, and assembly verifications in the upcoming weeks, before being transported back to the launch site for a full-stack wet dress rehearsal atop its partner, Super Heavy Booster 11. Booster 11 has been inside the Mega Bay workstand since November 20. The booster has already completed its cryogenic proof testing and should be ready for static fire testing as soon as the orbital launch mount is once again available for rocket testing. The launch mount is currently under inspection and repairs to address the damages it sustained during IFT-3. The main liquid oxygen and liquid methane cryogenic hoses that supply the booster suffered significant damage during Flight 3. The hoses are currently being replaced with brand new ones. The launch mount will be ready to host booster testing only after all the inspections and repair works are completed. Since no major damage other than the broken hoses was reported, we can hope that the repairs will be completed by the first week of April, and Booster 11 will be rolled out to the launch site for static fire testing by the second week. Once static fire testing and the subsequent full-stack wet dress rehearsal are complete, SpaceX will enter into the final round of preparations for integrated flight test 4. As per the latest reports, SpaceX is aiming for no earlier than the last week of April for Flight 4. Meanwhile, the company is still analyzing data from the third Starship flight, which launched from Starbase on March 14. Additionally, the FAA is conducting an investigation into the mishap that occurred during that flight test. Only after the investigation is complete and corrective actions are implemented will SpaceX receive a modified launch license for Flight 4. Since Flight 3 was almost completely successful, we can hope that the investigation will not turn up any major issues that could significantly delay the next launch. While the Flight 4 mission profile has yet to be finalized, it is expected to resemble Flight 3, featuring liftoff from Starbase, hot stage separation, and booster splashdown in the Gulf of Mexico. Ship 29 may conduct an in-space propellant transfer demonstration, a payload bay door test, and the Raptor relight test, which was skipped during IFT-3 due to observed high vehicle roll rates during the coast phase. Ultimately, the focus of Flight 4 will be on the successful controlled re-entry and ocean splashdown of both the ship and the booster, as these were the major milestones not achieved in Flight 3. This was confirmed by Elon Musk through a post on X, stating the goal is to get through maximum re-entry heating with all systems functioning. Starships and Super Heavies that will be launched on subsequent flights after Flight 4 are currently in various stages of development at the build site. Teams are installing the final pieces of thermal protection system tiles on Starship 31 inside the high bay, where Ship 30 also resides. The stacking of the methane tank section of Booster 14 is nearing completion inside the mega bay. Once stacking is complete and the grid fins are installed, the methane tank section will be placed atop the already completed oxygen tank section to complete Booster 14. You may remember the old Super Heavy Booster 4, which was originally intended to be launched on the first integrated flight test, along with Starship 20. Booster 4 has been resting at the Rocket Garden after its retirement since June 2022. In an unexpected move, the booster was moved into the Mega Bay the past week. 
Subsequently, it was scrapped by cutting it into several pieces. This may have been done to make room at the Rocket Garden to stock future ships and boosters as SpaceX's production rate increases each day. Starship 20 is still in the Rocket Garden, next to ships 26 and 32. At the Massey's test site, located several kilometers from Starbase, teams are diligently working on constructing the new Starship static fire test stand and a massive flame trench. The test stand, with the Starship positioned on top, will be placed over the flame trench for static fire testing. The exhaust from the six Raptor engines of the ship will be safely directed away by the flame trench. The flame trench will feature a liquid-cooled flame deflector, designed with water channels to facilitate efficient cooling. The deflector consists of three separate pieces. The first piece arrived at Massey several weeks ago, and the second piece arrived on March 24. As per reports, the third and final piece is still being fabricated at SpaceX's McGregor factory. Once that piece arrives at Massey's, all three will be joined together to complete the deflector. Then holes will be drilled on the water channels, through which high-pressure water will be sprayed during testing. The water will create a protective layer over the deflector, shielding it from the intense heat of the Raptor exhaust plume. Once operational, the new test stand at Massey's will enable SpaceX to conduct significantly more powerful and prolonged static fire tests compared to those currently performed at the launch site. In a surprising turn of events, teams have initiated the demolition of the Starship orbital launch mount legs erected at Kennedy Space Center's Pad 39A. It's currently unclear why SpaceX is demolishing these six legs, which were completed in 2022. It's possible that SpaceX decided to reinforce the launch pad's foundation before the installation of the water deluge system. Removing the legs could facilitate modifications to the pad and streamline the construction of the deluge system. Alternatively, SpaceX might be redesigning the launch mount legs to enhance their overall strength. If this is the case, the upgraded design may also be implemented at the second launch pad currently under construction at Starbase. Only time will reveal the true motive behind this development. Meanwhile, the launch mount ring for Pad 39A has been sighted outside SpaceX's Hangar M at Cape Canaveral, awaiting transport to its designated location. This picture is a radar image from one of the Umbra space satellites. While the launch tower at Pad 39A is fully assembled and equipped with rocket stacking and catching arms, there is still significant work to be done, including the integration of the ship's quick disconnect arm, plumbing, and electrical installations. As mentioned in previous updates, SpaceX has plans to build a Starship launch pad at Cape Canaveral, either by repurposing SLC-37 or constructing a new pad designated as SLC-50. Altogether, the increasing number of Starship launch pads will significantly boost Starship launch cadence, playing a pivotal role in realizing Elon Musk's ambitious vision of colonizing Mars. Now, let's discuss some of the latest updates from the world of science and technology. The United Launch Alliance's powerful Delta IV heavy rocket is ready for its final launch. The mission, dubbed NROL-70, for the U.S. National Reconnaissance Office, is currently scheduled to lift off from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station on Friday, March 29. The rocket will carry a classified spy satellite, aimed at providing a wide range of timely intelligence information to national decision-makers, warfighters, and intelligence analysts. The webcast is expected to cut off after the payload fairing separation, at the request of the reconnaissance office, as the satellite's instruments and activities are classified. NROL-70 will mark the end of an era for the United Launch Alliance and the Delta family of rockets. Originating in 1960, the Delta rocket family has been instrumental in both space exploration and national security missions. The first iteration of the Delta rocket, known as the Thor Delta, made its debut on 13 May 1960, with the launch of NASA's Echo 1A, the world's first passive communications satellite. Over the ensuing years, the Thor Delta undertook over 50 missions, deploying various scientific and reconnaissance satellites into orbit. Subsequent decades witnessed continuous evolution and enhancement of the Delta rockets, incorporating cutting-edge technologies and innovations to enhance performance and reliability. The development of the Delta II rocket began in the early 1980s with the aim of creating a reliable and cost-effective launch vehicle capable of deploying a variety of payloads into orbit. Delta II achieved numerous milestones from 1990 to 2018, launching 150 missions, including several Mars missions, as well as the Kepler and the Spitzer Space Telescopes. The Delta III rocket, although short-lived, made significant contributions to the Delta legacy, serving as a stepping stone to the development of the Delta IV family. The Delta IV family is comprised of two main variants, the Delta IV Medium and the Delta IV Heavy. The Delta IV Medium was distinguished by the number of solid rocket boosters and the payload fairing size. The rocket had the capacity to launch payloads into a range of orbits. 
Delta IV Medium was launched 29 times between 2002 and 2019, all of which were successful. The Delta IV Heavy, on the other hand, is the most powerful variant in the Delta IV family, featuring three liquid-fueled common booster cores, clustered together to provide unparalleled lift capability. The design allowed the Delta IV Heavy to loft massive payloads into orbit, including spacecraft destined for deep space exploration and heavy satellite deployments. Since its inaugural flight in 2004, the Delta IV Heavy has completed 15 launches, all of which were completely successful, except for the first mission, which was deemed a partial failure. In 2014, the rocket launched NASA's Orion spacecraft on its maiden flight, Exploration Flight Test 1. This mission tested critical systems and technologies of the Orion spacecraft for its crewed missions to the Moon and deep space destinations. Delta IV Heavy successfully launched NASA's Parker Solar Probe in 2018 to study the Sun's outer atmosphere and provide valuable insights into solar wind and space weather phenomena. The early Delta rockets were developed by various organizations involved in the United States space program. Boeing and Lockheed Martin merged in 2006 to form ULA and inherited the responsibility for the Delta IV family of rockets. With over 300 launches since 1960, boasting a 95% success rate, the Delta family's contributions to the advancement of space exploration and satellite deployment are undeniable. After the retirement of the Delta IV Heavy, ULA will transition to using the new Vulcan Centaur rocket for future launches. The first launch of the Vulcan Centaur took place in January this year, which carried the Peregrine Lunar Lander as part of NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Initiative. The mission, unfortunately, faced technical challenges as the lander encountered issues with its propulsion system, preventing it from achieving a soft landing on the lunar surface. The spacecraft ultimately had to be directed towards Earth, where it burned up upon re-entry over the South Pacific. Please check out my previous videos to learn about the Vulcan Centaur and Peregrine lander in detail. Links are in the description. Russia's Soyuz MS-25 spacecraft successfully docked to the International Space Station the past week, bringing three astronauts to the orbiting laboratory. The Soyuz MS-25 mission lifted off aboard a Soyuz 2.1A rocket from the Baikonur Cosmodrome on March 23, carrying mission commander and Roscosmos cosmonaut Oleg Novitsky, NASA astronaut Tracy C. Dyson, and Marina Vasilovskaya, a space flight participant and the first Belarusian woman to fly to space. It was Russia's 71st Soyuz mission to embark on a voyage to the ISS since 2000. The launch was initially scheduled for March 21, but the launch was scrubbed just 20 seconds before liftoff, when onboard computers detected low voltage readings in the rocket's first stage electrical system. It was the first ever such abort for a Soyuz rocket, requiring a day for Russian engineers to analyze telemetry data, identify the issue, and replace suspect batteries. Subsequent assessments confirmed that all systems were ready for a second launch attempt on March 23. Approximately nine minutes into the flight, the spacecraft entered Earth's orbit and began its journey towards the ISS. Following a journey lasting roughly 50 hours, the spacecraft rendezvoused with the space station on the 25th and successfully docked to the Pritchell module on the Russian segment. Two and a half hours later, the hatches between the Soyuz and the ISS were opened, allowing the three-member MS-25 crew to enter the space station, where they joined the seven existing crew members. All ten astronauts then gathered for a short welcome ceremony to begin their joint mission. Dyson will spend six months aboard the station, engaging in advanced space research and undertaking a spacewalk. She is set to return to Earth in September with cosmonauts Oleg Kononenko and Nikolai Chup, who will complete a year-long mission in the laboratory. Novitsky and Vasilovskaya will be aboard the station for 12 days, hosting science and educational activities, before returning home with NASA astronaut Laurel O'Hara on April 6, aboard the Soyuz MS-24 spacecraft. O'Hara will have spent 204 days in space when she returns. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.